Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to talk in fairly broad terms to set up this very interesting looking conference, which is going to cover some of the things I'm touching on here in more detail and from, more, and from different perspectives about a subject that I think will be familiar to a lot of people in this room. Um, but I think it's also of interest for ways Alfred suggested, not just to people who are interested in conspiracy theory, but people who are interested actually in the substance of the topic, which is the fact that arguments about climate change seem to be particularly infected, contaminated, with the language of conspiracy theory, or as it's sometimes called, conspiracism. The suspicions that we associate with conspiracy theory run right the way through arguments about climate change in books, in journal journalism, particularly online, um, in the kind of blogosphere, if that's what it's still called. And it tends to be at the margins. I mean, it's, it's where the debate is most polemical and most polarized. But it runs right across the argument. It is striking how quickly, when you're reading something about climate change, that is in some sense polemical, the register slips back into a kind of conspiracist framework very, very quickly. It looks like the default discourse for talking about climate change in lots of different settings. And this is, I think a lot of people find, surprising and disturbing. I'm not going to give you lots of evidence for this, but people who've, who've studied it, look at it, it's, it's familiar that discussion about hoaxes, scams, cover-ups, disinformation, propaganda, cons, the idea that there are hidden forces at work, secret powers, that you should follow the money. All of this runs across arguments about climate change. And a lot of the familiar tropes of conspiracy theory crop up time and time again. Scientists are a kind of mafia. My favorite line, if you're a scientist who doubts the consensus, you will wake up and find a polar bear's head in your bed. That's the kind of <laughs> register for relatively mainstream climate denialism. Comparisons with Stalinist propaganda, Nazi propaganda. The BBC is running a Goebbels-esque operation when it does its weather forecasts. That quote is from someone I'm going to talk about later on, uh, the brother of the new leader of the Labour Party, Piers Corbyn. It's from his website that I will be summoning up in a minute, but not now. You have to listen to the other stuff before we get onto that. <laughs> Um, the adding of gate to the end of something, which is obviously a classic conspiracist trope. There are lots of gates out there, but climate gate is one of the few that has really got legs and has entered the language. Climate gate is now quite a common appellation to describe a range of things, but I'm sure most people will remember originally to describe a tranche of emails that came out of the University of East Anglia that seemed to show that the peer review process was being corrupted by a group of scientists who were trying to conceal the level of doubt there is about the scientific consensus from the public. That became climate gate. I should also add that as with any conspiracy theory, I don't think that there is a widespread conspiracy out there that doesn't have an anti-Semitic strand to it. And there is an anti-Semitic strand to this, just as I was coming in, Joe Yuzinski was telling me that if, we look, if I was to look at the comments on Open Democracy about some of the pieces that we've written, you quite quickly get to the really nasty stuff um, about the Rothschilds and so on. I was going to put up, we've learned this lesson, I was going to, the other website I was going to show you was one which um, gives you the photographs of a, the, what are described as the leading climatologists and campaigners in favour of the idea that man-made climate change is a serious problem, starting with Lord Stern, Nicholas Stern, and it runs through 20 or 30 of them. And under each one, it just says Ashkenazi Jew, Ashkenazi Jew, Ashkenazi Jew. We have learned on this project that if you give a talk and it's being recorded and someone does a screenshot of you gesticulating. <laughs> so we did one last year where I introduced a talk about um, Turkish conspiracy theories. And I was, as I tend to do, kind of gesticulating like this. And uh, the... the so sort of cover shot for the lecture was a wall of graffiti and at the bottom left hand corner was a particularly nasty piece of anti-Semitic graffiti and I was just doing that and we had to take the talk off our <laughs> website. So I'm not going to put up, uh, so you just have to look for that one. It comes up first, I think, if you type in anti-Semitic climate change conspiracy theories and you'll find it. But I think one of the striking things about climate change conspiracy theories is actually the anti-Semitic strand is not dominant. <laughs> 
Um, it is a minor key in it, not true of lots of other conspiracy theories. The dominant strands are the kind of mafia propaganda strands. The idea particularly that science and scientists are running a kind of protection racket. It's the protection racket mode of conspiracy theorizing rather than the anti-Semitic one that dominates. But the other feature about climate change conspiracy theories that is so striking is that they are ecumenical in the sense that it does run both ways. So just as the climate denialists, and even not just denialists, but the more radical skeptics, see a conspiracy from science, from government, from lobbyists, which is driven by the kind of grant-guzzling, big government desire of leftists and environmentalists to suck up taxes that they wouldn't otherwise be able to raise. The environmentalists see those people as the front for an oil-guzzling, fossil fuel funneled operation which is designed to throw doubts on real science. So it does go both ways. So just to give you two emblematic book titles, um, Senator James Inhofe, a United States Senator, well-known book, um, which is a kind of perfect primer of mainstream climate denial conspiracy theory. It's called The Greatest Hoax, Why the Global Warming Conspiracy Threatens Your Future, and it runs through all of the tropes I'm going to be talking about in a bit. Then on the other side, you have a well-known book and film called Merchants of Doubt, and the subtitle of which, I'll paraphrase it, but is roughly how a handful of scientists are subverting the truth about issues ranging from big tobacco to climate change. And even on that side, too, the idea that the, the doubters are themselves a front for a secret operation or a hidden operation, it also has the familiar tropes of conspiracy theory. It's a handful of people. The real power is behind the scenes. You have to follow the money. Even the phrase big tobacco is always a warning sign that a conspiracy theory is not far around the corner. So there are conspiracy theories that run both ways in this, and they do tend to infect a surprisingly wide range of the argument. So the question I just want to talk about for about 25 minutes, I'll try not to go on beyond that, is why, what is it about climate change that means that it seems to attract so much of this kind of rhetoric and discourse? And why is climate change an issue where even what you might call the reasonable center is so quickly colonized by these kinds of arguments. And it seems to me that there are two possible kinds of explanations. I mean, there are probably lots, but two very broad categories of explanations. One of which is that the, the infection of the climate change issue by conspiracy theory language tells us something about the times that we live in. That is, climate change is a hot button or a polarizing issue of our times, and we live in a very conspiracy theory-minded age. So what it tells us is that when you get one of these polarizing issues, the prevalence of this kind of talk shows us just how quickly we fall back on this kind of suspicious, follow the money, who are the hidden forces, who's a crypto this, who's a crypto that kind of language, because it's everywhere in our culture. So on that account, it's a symptom of something wider going on in the culture. That would be one kind of explanation. It tells us we live in a conspiracist age, conspiracy-minded age. And the other kind of explanation would be, it tells us something about the issue of climate change. There's something about that issue in particular that makes it prone to these kinds of accusations and counter-accusations, and makes the accusations and counter-accusations hard to resist. Because there are conspiracy theories about everything, but maybe with climate change, the pushback is much harder. They infect the, the language of the argument because the counter-language is much harder to access. So it's either a symptom of the age we live in, or actually it tells us something particularly about climate change. And I think it's a mixture of the two. And I think the reason it's, it's so difficult and so pervasive to push back against it is that with the climate change question, something about the temper of our times gets mixed up with an issue that is particularly vulnerable to this kind of argument. And that's what makes it so entrenched. So I'll just run through some of the reasons why one might think it's not the issue itself, it's the period in which this has become an issue that is the explanation. And then some of the reasons why, no, it's the issue itself that's the explanation. And then I'll talk about Piers Corbyn. Um, so Joe Yuzinski, who's here in his book with um, Joe Parent, his excellent book on American conspiracy theories, very persuasively makes the argument, book published last year, I think, very persuasively makes the argument that we always have a tendency to overstate the extent to which we live in a particularly kind of conspiracy theory infected age. And the assumption that the internet and social media and new forms of global communications, they may have made certain kinds of conspiracy theories more visible, 
But it's probably not the case that there is more conspiracy out there now than ever before. And um, Uzinski and Parent show in their book that through various ways of tracking it, there seems to be a fairly constant level of conspiracy-minded explanations for the things that people don't like in the worlds of politics and policy over the last 100 plus years. And if anything, it might have gone down slightly compared to earlier in the 20th century or even at the end of the 19th century. And so we shouldn't overstate the volume of conspiracy theory out there because actually probably there isn't more of it than ever before. There is a kind of certain number of people who revert to these explanations when the going gets tough for the, world, the way they want the world to be. So the volume doesn't vary, but the kind of direction varies. So what varies over time is the targets, where the conspiracy theories are directed, and most straightforwardly, um, it depends who's in the White House in the North American case. When a Republican is in the White House, then the conspiracy theories from the people who feel like they are the outs, the Democrats, are that the conspiracy is a kind of Wall Street conspiracy, big money is. And when a Democrat is in the White House, as now, then there's a kind of foreign powers conspiracy, communist conspiracy, Obama is really a Muslim, the Bertha stuff. And so it kind of tracks power rather than sort of new technology leading to an explosion of this. But they do also say in the book that there are certain periods where conspiracy theory does become more widespread and ecumenical. And the two examples that they give, the 1890s, and the recent financial crisis probably has more in common with the crash, the Great Depression or Recession of the 1890s than it does with anything since. It's you know, Post-2008 is more like the 1890s than it is like the 1930s or the 1970s. And in the 1890s, suspicion of moneyed interest, business interest, Wall Street, and just the way that money works in politics cut across party divides. There was suspicion on both sides. Another period was the late 40s, early 50s, the McCarthyite scare period, the you know, communist scare period, where conspiracy theories, again, seemed to cut across party lines. I mean, they were, it was more ecumenical. And my sense of it, although you know, this is just a sense of it, is that we're living through another such period now, post-2008. There does seem to be a more pervasive conspiracist-style suspicion across party divides than at previous periods, almost certainly, I think, because of the financial crisis. And one of the things that Occupy and the Tea Party movement have in common is that they reject the received wisdom because they think the received wisdom can't be trusted. You always have to want to know what's behind it the forces that work behind it. And suspicion of the way that money operates in politics cuts across party divides, suspicion of banks cuts across party divides. Populism, as we know, is on the rise on the left and on the right. And both left populism and right populism is conspiracy-minded. And it has been given a big impetus post-2008. So I think we probably are living in an age <clears throat> where the tendency to fall back on conspiracist explanations isn't just these people do it because the other lot are in power, but it cuts across the ins and the outs in that almost everyone in some sense or other at the moment feels like they're an out. And conspiracist explanations seem to fit some of the things we've learned about how the world works in the past. And it, maybe you could track it back even to the Iraq war, but in the last decade or so. And in that case, the fact that climate should be a very conspiracist argument would fit the thought that this is one of those periods where falling back on conspiracy theories is something that people reach, to, reach for across the political spectrum. And I think there is something in that. I think there's also some evidence, though I don't want to push this too hard, that um, doubts about climate change, scepticism, borderline denialism, seems to flourish where conspiracy theory flourishes more generally. And the evidence I'm going to give for that, um, this is from a couple of years ago, but it was a, I thought it was a very striking survey. It was a Pew survey which asked people in different countries in the world whether they thought that man-made climate change was a serious threat. And it was very striking how much it varied. From places like Pakistan and Egypt, where 15 or 16 percent of the population accepted it was a serious threat. So only a tiny minority of people thought that climate change was a serious threat through to South Korea, where 85% of people thought it was a serious threat. That is a huge spread. And Britain was in the middle, 50, roughly. Uh, but in this survey, um, America was divided into two countries, because it is two countries, the United States, Republican land and Democrat land. And in Republican land, only 25% of people accepted that <coughs> climate change represented a serious threat two years ago. And in Democrat land, it was roughly 65%. 
What does Egypt, Pakistan, and Republican land have in common? What they have in common is that falling back on conspiracist explanations of how politics works is very, very widespread. So in our project, we have had people come to talk to us about politics in Pakistan, politics in places like Egypt, and the extent to which a complicated mix of factors, including colonial and post-colonial history, the relationship between the fragility of democracy and the prevalence of coups, suspicions of the United States, produce a kind of political climate in which conspiracist explanations are politics. I mean, that is how people talk about politics. You know, it's not the default explanation, it just is the explanation. I mean, it is just what explains how the world works. And there see, it seems striking, because I, I mean, why else would Pakistan and Egypt be the two countries where people don't believe in climate change? unless they don't believe in anything that anyone tells them because there's no reason to trust anyone in an official position, which is something that they have in common with Republican land when Obama is in the White House. So on that reading, but I'm going to say why I don't think you can push it too hard, on that reading, places where people have really think they have good reasons to doubt the, the received wisdom generally, the official version, what elites tell them, they also seem to doubt climate change. I think reasons that you can't push it too hard is that the, second, the country that had the second highest positive answer of people saying they thought climate change was a serious threat was Brazil. I don't think Brazil is a country where people automatically assume that when a politician says something, it must be true. I mean, I think Brazil is the kind of country where conspiracist explanations also flourish. So it can't simply be the case that you know, where there's radical mistrust of established institutions, people also don't believe in climate change because they believe in climate change in Brazil. And I think there are other reasons as well to think that you can't just say where conspiracy theory flourishes, conspiracism infects climate. Because, first of all, that infecting of arguments about climate with suggestions of conspiracy predates, if I think there's this period of the last 10 years or so, where a more widespread ecumenical kind of conspiracy thinking has spread across politics. Cl conspiracist explanations of what's going on in climate change arguments predate that. If you look at the arguments from the 1990s, if you look, for instance, at the arguments around uh, Bjorn Lomborg's book, The Skeptical Environmentalist, which came out in 2001, I think, and there's quite a good online archive of the whole range of controversies and provocations that that book threw up. So this is 2001, so this is pre the collapse of confidence in established institutions across the Western world. But those arguments, it is striking how quickly on both sides people fall back on what look like soft conspiracist explanations of what's going on. Who is Lomborg a front for? Who's corrupted the peer review process? Where is the oil money? Where is the big government money? He's a Scandinavian, so he must believe X. He's in favor of this. He's Respectable arguments on both sides very quickly fall back on these kinds of explanations. There's something going on with the issue which isn't just tracking a more widespread suspicion of the received wisdom. I think the second reason is that it's not true even in Republican land that people don't believe anything that anyone says who stands in a position of authority or elite power. I mean, it's not true that Republicans don't believe anything that scientists say about anything. It's not true that they reject the scientific consensus across the board. On some issues, Republicans accept the scientific consensus, for, for instance, on GM foods, and Democrats reject it. This conference will talk about some of these issues. Alfred mentioned vaccination. You know, it's a complicated picture. You can't just say, in Republican land, Republicans believe that science is a conspiracy, and in Democrat land, they don't. Republicans, and there's no such thing as just generic Republicans, it really varies issue by issue, subject by subject. It depends what they have at stake. You know, you're much more likely to believe science is a conspiracy when you don't have the disease that the medical profession will tell you how to cure. So you can't just say that in certain climates, all issues get infected with this because they don't. Climate seems to be particularly infected by it. And then one other kind of counterexample, I don't think it's the case that arguments about economics since 2008 are quite as infected by conspiracist discourse as arguments about climate change. Now it's true that arguments about economics, macroeconomics, how the world works, have got a lot of conspiracy lines in them. And it's also true that post-2008, we now know that there are a lot of conspiracies out there. I mean, the 2008 crash was when the tide came out, and when the tide comes out, the conspiracies are exposed. They were fixing the LIBOR rate. 
Now, the banks, these are real conspiracies. So there are real conspiracies, and there are lots of conspiracy theories about how banking works, and a lot of them are deeply anti-Semitic. But it's not the case that, for example, in the arguments between Paul Krugman and his critics about how the economy works, people just fall back on conspiracist explanations all the time. I mean, I, what's striking to me about Paul Krugman and the way he writes about the people he disagrees with is he doesn't try and say what's really going on behind the scenes, who's pulling the strings. He says they're morons. They don't understand anything. And the argument comes back the other way. He may have a Nobel Prize, but he's an idiot. That's different from who's paying Krugman to say this stuff? Who's, you know, which big money, big power organization is really behind the scenes? There's a lot of that going on in arguments in economics, but I don't think you would say that post-2008 crash, economics as a kind of way of thinking about the world has been entirely corrupted by conspiracist discourse. But climate change, it hasn't been entirely corrupted, but it is really, really prevalent. So what I want to do just for the last second half of this talk is try and flag up some of the reasons why climate change might be particularly vulnerable to these kinds of accusations and counter-accusations. So again, I'll just do very broadly three reasons. The first is that climate change is an issue that puts a uniquely high premium on trust if anyone's going to do anything about it. So it can be characterised, climate change can be characterised as an issue that has four unique characteristics to it as a sort of politics policy problem. You know, how are we going to solve it if you believe it exists? It is uniquely long term. That is, whatever we do now, the payoff for better or for worse will be a long way in the future. It is uniquely global as a problem. It's very hard to see how there could be a unilateral solution to climate change. It is uniquely uncertain to the extent that however much that consensus there might be about the causes and the motors of climate change, there is no agreement at all about the consequences because no one knows. Now, if you, you, know, you read all of the mainstream consensus arguments, there are massive variations, fluctuations, differences about the level of risk, what the risk means, what it might translate into. And it's also uniquely irreversible in that the climate change that has happened, we're not going to turn it back. There doesn't, there doesn't look like there's any way to go back to where we were before. And a lot of these effects are already built in. I mean, we're trying to stop things, as it were, 20 years ahead, given that we have to assume that a lot of this stuff can't be stopped now. Which means that if you think that politicians and the established elite voices that uh, tell us we should be worried about this are going to be able to do anything about it, you have to put a huge amount of trust in their hands to deliver coordinated, long-term, globalised serious action on this issue. You have to give them the power now and then trust that they will use the power wisely for these uniquely long-term payoffs. And what that means is that what's most visible in the present is the transfer of power, not the consequences and not the reason why the power has been transferred. And the other thing that is clear is that it puts this huge premium on trust, which means evidence that you can't trust politicians is hugely corrosive for a sort of reasonable discourse about these issues. So that's the space in which conspiracy theory flourishes, where there's a problem that requires certain capacities to solve, and then there is evidence that the capacities cannot be met by politicians. So then the question is asked, well, what are the politicians really up to? If there's a huge mismatch between the nature of the, of the problem and the capacities that seem to exist for the solution, with the politicians demanding more and more power to close the gap, Conspiracy theory flourishes in that space because the conspiracy theorists say, why do they want the power? The gap is too wide, so they must want the power for its own purposes. And then there's a kind of inner, more pervasive climate of mistrust. There's a vicious circle effect, I think, which is people don't trust politicians. This issue requires a huge amount of trust on the part of people to empower the politicians to take action to solve it. The politicians know they're not going to get that trust from the people because the people don't trust them at present. If the politicians want to solve it, therefore they have to do things behind the people's backs or in unelected institutions, or Obama has to do it by executive order and not through Congress. They as it were, have to bypass public opinion or democratic opinion in order to do what needs to be done, which confirms the view of the people that they're not to be trusted. 
And so you get that kind of back and forth. If you're going to do anything about it in this climate, you have to do the things that remind the people why they didn't trust you in the first place, because they are essentially bypassing you to get it done. And then you get the complete reversal, which you, you know, the, the pure conspiracy theory about climate change, which is the people who say it's a serious problem say it's the kind of problem that requires coordinated international action and the empowering of international institutions in order to solve. So climate change requires empowered institutions. And the conspiracy theory says that's the wrong way around. Empowered institutions require climate change. Like the only way the UN is going to get the power, the global power that it's always secretly wanted, is to invent an issue like climate change, which allows them to demand the power in the present for a future on which they're never going to have to deliver. And that's the conspiracy theory. So you get from mistrust in politics and an issue that puts a premium on trust to this complete inversion of what looks like the rational explanation. They've invented climate change because they want the power. They don't want the power to solve climate change. That then leads to the second reason I think that climate change is particularly vulnerable as an issue to conspiracy mindsets. And that's because climate change is an issue that's particularly vulnerable to accusations of hypocrisy. And I think there is quite a close connection between hypocrisy and conspiracy theory in that hypocrisy literally means wearing a mask. Got something to hide. Why else would you wear a mask? You know, a hypocrite was originally an actor on the Greek stage wearing a mask. but it, what it means, obviously, is that mismatch between the public performance and the private views or the private performance. And climate change, because of some of the features I mentioned, it's uniquely long-term and global aspects and so on, there's almost always a mismatch between what any individual says and does and the nature of the problem. And what conspiracy theorists tend to focus on, on the kind of denialist or sceptical side, is the mismatch between what politicians say about what we need to do about climate change and what they do. So the crude versions are... Obama has been giving speeches over the past summer about the need to take action on climate change and to give these speeches he's been flying around the United States in a wide-bodied private jet. QED, you know, if there's that gap between what he says and what he does, we want the real explanation for what he does. Because you know, he can't believe what he says, because if he believed what he says, he wouldn't do that. So there must be another reason, and of course the reason is he doesn't believe what he says, he's actually part of a United Nations plot to empower global institutions for which the American people wouldn't elect because they're freedom-loving. So you know, that, I mean, in Host book has got you know, the, the classic one, which was Al Gore left his air conditioning on when he went to tell people that they should all share a bath or whatever it was, and no one <laughs> who leaves their air conditioning on can be trusted on this issue. It's not a, it's not a large step from there to conspiracy theory because conspiracy theory flourishes in the space between what people say and what they do, or what they said now and what they once said. And the next step with the Al Gore one, if you look at the, you know, the almost limitless online iterations of this, if you really want to know what's going on with Al Gore's crusade about climate change, you simply have to look at how much money he has earned in the last 10 years. That's the explanation. That's why he can afford to leave his air conditioning on. That's the conspiracy theory. But I think it also relates to science in that it's an issue in which scientists also can quite quickly or easily be identified as hypocrites for the reasons that Alfred was saying, in that science is meant to be this neutral, apolitical way of viewing the world, evidence-based, you know, peer review is meant to be this kind of pure process where no one ever favours their friends and punishes their enemies, and of course we know that that's true. But <laughs> on the climate issue, it exists in this climate of mistrust, of received wisdom, of consensus, consensus politics, consensus in terms of what the official line is on anything. And any scientist operating in that climate is going to have to think about the politicization of their subject. I mean, I don't think you can, as a scientist, remain neutral in a climate where your subject has been politicized because your enemies will just gobble you up and spit you out. I mean, when I read the Climate Gate emails, I thought, well, of course they're thinking like this. I mean, who wouldn't think about how it looks in a world where how it looks is what drives the politics? So, I mean, it seems to me natural, I don't think, that they were corrupting the peer review process, but I think they were behaving like human beings in worrying about how it might look or how you have to kind of manage the PR of this even 
as it were, in the behind the scenes scientific discussions. But if in a climate where politicians have to think like that because of the mistrust about the received version of things, it is discovered that politicians are thinking like that, you get another vicious circle effect. That confirms the doubters. That's what Climate Gate was. Climate Gate seems to me more a reflection not of how scientists think, but of how people think about scientists. That's what it tells you. But of course, it confirmed the people who didn't trust scientists in what they think about scientists. And you get that vicious circle. So it's the issue and the climate of mistrust come together. And then the third one, um, I think is a wider issue and maybe a wider issue for this conference, the really difficult question of how systems of political representation map onto scientific argument, and particularly that space in all scientific argument which is occupied by reasonable doubt. You know, any, any scientific consensus is surrounded by a kind of penumbra of reasonable doubt. You know, there might be a solid consensus at the middle, say a consensus about the core drivers of climate change. But the further away you get from that and you get towards the likely consequences, the risks, what we should do about it, the politics and so on, you get more and more doubt and uncertainty. So you've got a, you know, a core center and then more and more doubt. It's really hard to map that onto an adversarial system of political representation, where, as it were, the certainties are here and here, and the doubt is somewhere in the middle. And the certainty, certain doubt, seems to me, particularly in the United States and Britain, where we have this kind of binary politics because of our political systems, certain doubt squeezes out uncertain doubt. It's hard to know who speaks for the people who really don't know on this issue, and how are they going to get heard in a political climate where there is a premium on certainty, because there is in politics. Um, you know, if in doubt, it's probably the person who is more certain who's going to win the argument. Um, I mean, that may not be always true, but there certainly seems to be a bias that way. And I just want to give a couple of examples of this to finish. Um, so one is um, from American Republican politics. And, and it is a complicated picture, so just reading about it recently, that survey two years ago that said 25% of Republican voters didn't think that climate change was a serious threat. Other surveys have found a much higher figure, up to 40 plus percent of Republicans. And it seems to be moving over time in that it seems to be an issue that more and more Republican voters are willing to say they recognize is something that someone needs to do something about. Um, but at the same time, the number of Republican representatives in Congress who are willing to represent those people, i.e. the Republicans who you know, they're not sure what should be done. You know, they have a lot of doubt around the edges, but they're willing to accept the sort of kernel of consensus. How they should be represented, that number seems to be going down. So it's not the case. Actually, in the Open Democracy piece I wrote, I think I said no Republican representatives speak for them. But again, I've now looked, and some do. <laughs> but um, I did check just like an hour ago. I haven't had time to watch it. I don't know if anyone has time or the will to watch the Republican debate last night. Um, between... 12, 11, 12? How many candidates? Um, but they were asked a question about climate change. So, I, so, so a conspiracy theorist on this issue would say already, like, you know where I stand. So I'm, I'm reading the Guardian report on this, which clearly <laughs> is not to be trusted. Uh, but according to the Guardian, <laughs> uh, you know, there are people, including Chris Christie, who accepts, in theory, accepts the science. Uh, but they were essentially asked what, you know, I mean, I think the question was, isn't it time to, this is the question, isn't it time to take out an insurance policy and approach climate change the Reagan way? You can read that how you might, but it's like, isn't it time to start actually thinking about what could go wrong here? Um, and even Chris Christie, who it was thought might come out and try and position himself against the rest, none of them were willing to say that they thought that this should be something on which they should commit themselves to action. Um, and Marco Rubio gave an answer which said that he didn't believe it was something that American politicians should be committing themselves to. And Chris Christie said, I agree with Marco. We shouldn't be destroying our economy in order to chase some wild left-wing idea that somehow by ourselves is going to fix the climate. So there you get that kind of exactly the sorts of things I've been talking about. If this is genuinely a global problem, but you've got national politicians trying to empower themselves off the back of it, you need to ask yourself not what's the nature of the problem, but why are they using the problem to... You know, it's, it's a wild left-wing idea. And it's hugely polarising. I mean, the fact that, that, that none of these people sought to capture 
the possible primary votes of the maybe up to 45% of Republicans who take this issue seriously, is striking that something is being squeezed out here. And then the other example I want to give you is this guy. Oh, I need to unlock the computer. What's the password? Uh, okay. Oh, that's a long one. Really? The part I can tell you the, the, the password is very it's got a no with a line through it. That's just a zero. That's zero. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the password is wombat twenty fourteen, which I think is exclamation point. If you don't put the exclamation point. Exclamation point. I think that's a very suspicious password. <laughs> so um, People who study conspiracy theories will recognize this kind of website because this is what they look like. It doesn't matter that you can't see what it says because that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that it goes on and 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 on. And that's the front page to entice you into the real stuff. <laughs> and this is the website of Piers Corbyn, the brother of Jeremy Corbyn, the newly elected leader of the British Labour Party, who is a... Um, climate change denier, I mean not sceptic, denier, and a conspiracy theorist in that his explanations are, you know, this is, he uses all of the classic tropes, this is a sort of, you know, the scientific consensus is a kind of protection racket, people like him are intimidated and excluded, you need to follow the money, follow the power, look for the interests, the BBC is part of it, and so on. Um, the reason he is committed to doubting climate change is he's an alternative weather forecaster and he runs a business that says, you can predict the weather up to a year ahead by doing sunspots. So he's committed to the idea that sunspots are what drive the climate. So, I mean, it, with him, you don't need a conspiracy theory. That's why he believes what he believes. So he has to say that um, climate change, you know, his business depends on it, that climate change is a con. And he has to have explanations of why everyone else believes in it and so on. Um, and it's the usual stuff. There's nothing particularly surprising about it. It's only interesting because his brother is now leader of the Labour Party. Um, and it has lots of fun stuff on it, like um, it has stuff about Prince Charles. He, he expresses his outrage that Prince Charles should believe in climate change when he, Piers Corbyn, was the only person who correctly predicted the weather for the wedding of William and Kate. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm sure he didn't correctly predict the weather, because I've checked some of his forecasts. I was reading it on that really rainy bank holiday, and he still had on the site his prediction that it was going to be really, really warm. <laughs> and he's now taken it down, which is very suspicious. Anyway, so here he is. Uh, there they are. And, th you know, it's the same person with different hair. Um, and when I was at um, Jeremy Corbyn's rally in Cambridge Sunday before last, um, and I was queuing with everyone else for hours to get in, I was talking to one of his organisers, and one of his organisers, who was a guy in his 60s, I think, and he said, oh, if you'd said to me back in the 70s, when I was really into this hard left stuff, that today I'd be like you know, attending a rally like this for Corbyn, you know, the, the great hope of the left. I'd have thought you were talking about Piers, not Jeremy, because he was the real kind of, he was the hardcore lefty back then, and he was the one who seemed to be going places, not his hopeless brother. Um, so th the reason I'm saying all of this is that Piers Corbyn has been kind of put on the spot, you know, how, how he's supporting Jeremy, because his politics are broadly the same as Jeremy's, but how can you be a climate denier when Jeremy is quite clearly... Um, an enthusiast for environmental causes, absolutely believes in the consensus view on climate change, and, and indeed believes all of the things that people like Chris Christie suspect of climate change um, enthusiasts. He wants to radically empower the state to deal with this, including dealing with the big energy companies, taxing them, constraining them, and so on. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn neatly fits the Republican conspiracist view of climate change. So how, given that um, his brother also shares many of the elements of the conspiracy theory, can he reconcile himself as a supporter of his brother? And he is a supporter of his brother because we can see up here somewhere, a glorious day, well done. <laughs> so he says, um, and it's just here, though they disagree, the important thing about Jeremy is that he stands for proper debate and accountability in politics. That Jeremy Corbyn, um, as someone who believes in crowdsourcing Prime Minister's question time and opening things up, opening the party up, you know, bottom-up debate. The implication is that the establishment have frozen views like Piers Corbyn's views out. And what his brother offers is the possibility of an open debate in which finally we'll get a fair hearing. 
to which I say, you have got to be kidding. <laughs> because you know, what's striking about the Jeremy Corbynist view of the world is it's also deeply, I think, infected for the reasons I said going back to the beginning, with a kind of conspiracist mindset. There's a lot of conspiracist thinking around the edges of Jeremy Corbyn's thinking. Yeah, he wants to crowdsource it because he's a populist. And this populism is the left populism, which is profoundly suspicious of received wisdom and established institutions. And already, even as leader in the past few days, Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, he falls back very, very quickly on accusations that there is a kind of plot out there against him among the media and the establishment and so on. And he's the voice of the people who are going to break through. I cannot see how the two brothers are going to have this kind of what you might call, you know, as he describes it, a proper debate and accountability in the centre ground of politics. What you are just going to get is conspiracy theory versus conspiracy theory. I mean, I don't know what goes on you know, at Christmas when they, <laughs> they probably agree not to talk about climate change. But the idea that what you're going to get with this new populism is the sort of openness where someone like Piers Corbyn is going to get a fair hearing is simply absurd, I think. I mean, what you're going to get with this populism is just this kind of vicious circle effect where conspiracy theory confronts conspiracy theory. And there is no evidence that when conspiracy theory confronts conspiracy theory, you get a kind of John Stuart Millian meeting of ideas and a testing of ideas to see which one can stand up to proper scrutiny. Because they're not scrutinizing each other. I mean, nothing on Cor Piers Corbyn's website is evidence of scrutiny of anything. It's just a giant conspiracy theory. When conspiracy theory meets conspiracy theory, you don't get political accountability and debate. You get you know, the infection of the discourse by conspiracy theory accelerated. I mean, I don't have any confidence that... And it does... I mean, I, my own feeling is that it's very unfair to kind of taint a brother by the craziness of his brother. But as I was saying to someone before I came in, you know, you know, often politicians have a slightly disreputable sibling. But in this case, I'm not sure which is the disreputable sibling <laughs> uh, and which is the politician. I don't think that you know, this is the way to get a democratic argument going about climate change, because I think there is a huge problem when that issue coincides with the kind of mistrust that we have around politics now driving this populism. Because what it does is it feeds the effect. It doesn't undo it. And the very last thing I'll say is that if there are these kind of vicious circles and the way in which these things are ensnaring with each other, what's going to break through? And this is the really, I think, sort of challenging feature of climate change as an issue, which is that even, say, with something like economics, uh, where this can also infect the argument, an event, a fact, an unarguable fact often breaks through. Something happens. The economy tanks. You know, the argument moves on. But because of the uniquely long-term nature of climate change as a problem, the kind of thing that could cut through Corbyn versus Corbyn to make them both face up to what they should be talking about in the space of reasonable doubt is almost certainly going to come too late for either Corbyn or Corbyn to do anything about it. That's it.